Welcome to the virtual meeting of the Licensing Regulatory Committee. It's 6 p.m. on Thursday, the 11th of March, 2021. My name is Councillor Linda Broadley, and I am chair of this committee. My fellow councillor, Councillor Latif Dar, is the vice chair. In accordance with the regulations made under Section 78 of the Coronavirus Act 2020, this remote meeting is being live streamed and recorded. The audio visual recording will be made available on the Council's website and YouTube channel shortly after the meeting. All meeting participants are reminded to speak slowly and clearly in the direction of their device's microphone at all times. A reminder that mobile phones and other electronic devices should be turned off or put on silent mode, and those participating in the meeting should refrain from taking telephone calls. For the purpose of recording the attendance, I can confirm that the following councillors are present and participating in this remote meeting. Rosemary Adams, myself, Linda Broadley, David Carter, Michael Charlesworth, the Vice Chair Latif Dahl, uh, Kamal Gratarata, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, uh, Jeffrey Kaufman, Lily Kaufman, Claire Kowalski and Helen Royal. We also have the following officers in attendance. Samuel Ball, Assistant Solicitor. Emily Burns, Administrative Assistant, Acting for the Democratic Services Officer. Tony Crawshaw, no, Crawthorne, Regulatory Services Manager. Dave Gill, Head of Law and Democracy and the Monitoring Officer. And Philippa Fisher, Head of Customer Services and Transformation. For the purpose of the regulations, I can confirm that before the remote meeting went live, all participants confirmed that they can see and or hear all of the participants. This meeting will be conducted in accordance with the Council's adopted remote meeting procedure rules, a summary of which is attached to tonight's agenda for reference. May I also politely remind all participants that they must not act in a loyal or disruptive manner or otherwise interfere with the committee's proper conduct of its business. Thank you. We move on to item one, apologies for absence. Thank you, Chair. Apologies received from councillors Frank Broadley, Robert Eaton, and Linda Eaton. We're also aware that Councillor Bill Bolter is having technical difficulties uh, with his device to connect and may at some point join the meeting via audio only. And I can confirm that Tracy Oldwinkle, the Senior Licensing and COVID Enforcement Officer, has also joined the meeting now. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Appointment of substitutes. No substitutes, Chair. Thank you. Declarations of interest. No, I can't see any hands raised. Minutes of the previous meeting. To read, confirm and sign the minutes of the previous meeting in accordance with Rule 19 of Part 4 of the Constitution. No objections? Move it, yeah. Thank you. Uh, item 5, action list arising from the previous meeting. To read, confirm and note the action list arising from the previous meeting. Is there any actions on that? The only action, Chair, was to, was to add the question about using an alternative that, <clears throat> um, London style. Okay, cab, thank you. And that was included in, in the consultation. Okay, lovely, thank you. Uh, petitions and deputations. Non received, Chair. Thank you. Item seven review of public spaces protection order, regulation of dogs 2021. A report from uh, the regulatory service manager, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, the report as set out and forwarded on to yourselves. The purpose of the report was to renew the public space protection order, which governs the control of dogs within the borough. As the legislation is made under the um, 
the, the legislation uh, under the Antisocial Behaviour Crime Policing Act, it sets a limit of three years on any um, order that is made and needs to be renewed and reviewed and renewed. There is still a need for um, dog control within the borough and through this that through this legislation, we um, I'm asking or requiring the councillors approve it. There are no changes to the PSPO that was initially um, provided uh, in February in September 2018. So, uh, but we have gone out to the full consultation as much as we did on the first one. We had no comments from any members of the public. We only had responses from the police who said they were aware of the legislation. And the other one was the Kennel Club, who are vastly in support of it. So if there's any questions from uh, councillors, I'm more than willing to take any questions. Thank you. I have some questions for you. Councillor David Carter, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I welcome this document um, and it's nice and succinct and easy to follow. Um, as the officer mentioned there was a response from the kennel club and the kennel club raised concerns around two issues one was the uh, means to pick up and the other was related to uh, exemptions for assistance dogs so my first question i think relates to the means to pick up the kennel club raised various concerns about this do you think they're are you satisfied that their concerns are satisfactorily addressed by uh, point 5.1a, uh, where you make the observation that people uh, will be, and, and well, the phrase is, unless that person has reasonable excuse to failing to do so. So our office is happy that the Kennel Club's concerns are addressed by that point. The second issue relates to the disability uh, 6.B. Um, it mentions the phrase has a disability which affects his mobility and later on goes on to say upon which he relies for assistance. Should that those two points be gen gender neutral? And the third question that relates to this part of it is where it talks about a prescribed charity, um, five prescribed charities are listed in 7E. However, they do not include four charities which are listed on the Assistant Dogs UK website um, as being charities. Um, is there a reason for the omission of um, dog aid, dogs for good, the Seeing Dogs Alliance, and medical detection dogs. Thank you very much, Councillor Carter, uh, Chair. Um, in answer to the questions, um, the means to pick up are covered within that 5.1 um, and do place responsibilities on an own, uh, somebody in charge of a dog. So it, it covers anybody who's in charge of a dog to take action to pick up any waste that is there. In terms of the issues you were talking about it being general gender neutral um i've got no change no no objection to changing that policy it's just i say this is the one that was approved previously and it has just been reproduced in terms of um the document to indicate what will be on it um and sealed and signed by the chief executive and the um uh, the Mayor of the Council. Um, in terms of the final one, in terms of the list of, uh, on the animal aid, the list that we've been provided with was actually from the original legislation, um, the original guidance document that we were provided with back in 2018. I can go back and visit that prior to this um, being um, signed off uh, and add any additional ones, but this is that's why the leg the guidance there for those five is is there, not the additional ones that are on the uh, animal welfare uh, site. Hey, does that answer your question, Councillor Carter? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Can I just Thank raise you. one uh, one other query? 
um, okay. series of queries which are really more typographical accuracy and that relates to schedule three exclusion of dogs um, and there appears to be three inaccuracies in that list um, map number 15 refer refers to the Moorwoods play area my understanding is that Moorwoods is play spelt with a single o uh, map number 16 Rosemead Park is on Rosemead Drive not Rosemead Road and map 20 um, refers to Hillfield Park on Robert Ragway whereas it should be Florence Ragway. Um, and actually, when you look at the map further on in the document, it even attributes Robert Rag Way to being in Wigston. So those are perhaps inaccuracies that ought to be corrected. Um, and apologies if they were on the original document and not picked up then. OK, thank you, Mr. Uh, Councillor Carter. Uh, Mr. Ball, you wanted to say something. Yeah, if it, it assists, um, before the PSPO, uh, if members are minded to approve and recommend up to full council, um, in relation to Councillor Carter's um, point about gender neutrality, we can simply insert a, an interpretation clause uh, into the PSPO, so um, references to, to gender go each way, um, and we can make all the necessary amendments um, before that goes up. Okay, lovely. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Helen Roydle. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to um, see if it was a possible to insert a couple of words into the document with regards to the fouling, um, which is in sec page 11, section 3 of the report. Um, it's talking about fouling, meaning it's an offence um, if a dog defecates at any time on land to which the public has access to without it being removed. We have a huge problem in the area around here, and I don't, don't for one minute doubt that other areas have the same problem. We have people who not only allow their dogs to defecate and don't clear up, but we have a large number of people who do clean up after their dogs and then dispose of the bag by throwing it behind the green boxes or under cars or dropping it on pavement or even in some places, and I can't understand the like of me why they do it, hang it in a tree. Would it be possible in this document to insert something about um, disposal in the appropriate manner? We do have bins around the borough. People are able to take them home. There is no reason for them to dispose of them by throwing them somewhere on the public highway, which then causes another problem later on down the line. So I wonder, Mr. Cawthorn, if that is possible to insert into this document appropriate disposal. Um, it's an offence. They're turning around and saying, I've picked it up. What more do you want? I think they should dispose of it appropriately. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the, Chair, the answer uh, to that is that it's actually an offence for under with a fixed penalty notice under the PSPO in relation to allowing your dog uh, and not picking it up. Once it's picked up, it actually becomes litter. Um, and subsequent to that, if anybody disposes of it, it it's actually it's, it's followed up by a fixed penalty notice for littering, not under the PSPO. So there is already legislation that is available to the council um, to enforce that. The problems that we have is in relation to um, putting it within, within the PSPO. I think we would be duplicating legislation that's already in, in effect. And I bow to uh, Dave and... Um, sounds uh, greater knowledge than myself in that respect but it is litter once it is deposited um, once you've picked it up so it's the same as a bed or something that gets thrown into a hedge or something like that 
Um, it's very difficult to identify where it's come from, but we do have a duty to pick it up and do out and clean it. And if it was under the uh, PSPO, the actual enforcement of that is it is um, we can uh, uh, we can address people and inquire as to whether they have means of picking something up. Um, and once they've got once they've picked it up, I say that then becomes litter. So if they dispose of it, then that is a separate matter, and we can't check on that. Um, just ensuring that they've actually got some means of picking it up. Can I come back on that chair, please? Yes, of course you can. Thank you for that reply, and I can well understand what you're saying. Uh, two things about that: is it the same department that deals with the litter as it deals with the dog? Um, feces so therefore if somebody if our one of our officers sees that happening they can automatically um, take the appropriate action with under the litter act so first of all is that correct and secondly is the fine for dropping the litter equivalent to the fine for allowing the dog to defecate not clean up in the first place and Thank you. Uh, in, in terms of the legislation um, and the enforcement of it, we employed the uh, pest, uh, the animal control people to undertake our dog warden and also do our monitoring in terms of the enforcement of the PSPO. They have body cams, and if they witness it, what they would do is they would pass that response to um, the environmental health department and its officers from within the environmental health department who deal with littering issues. So the authorizations that the um, officers have is in relation to the PSPO rather than under the Environmental Protection Act, which is where the littering offence comes from. So are you saying then, yes, yeah, are you saying then, uh, Mr. Cawthorn, that the process would go through and there wouldn't be suddenly, oh, well, we can't deal with that because it's under another act. So if it is identified, if it's on record, we will prosecute under the Littering Act straightforward. It wouldn't then be an environmental officer has to go out again and do another witness. No, we can just um, follow through. Okay. Apologise. Um, no, it would be that the evidence that's gathered by the CCTV camera would be sufficient for us to undertake uh, an enforcement notice. And this is a fixed penalty notice uh, and it is the same fine, but it's an additional fine uh, to whatever it was. Thank you very much. That's answered my questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Jeffrey Corkman. Yeah, just uh, two things. One, I would, I would like to propose the recommendation. But it did occur to me while this debate was going on, should, I, should we declare an interest, those of us that own dogs and use the parks, where is it a declarable interest? Uh, and I wanted to congratulate Councillor Carter on his astute picking out of those, those errors uh, and whether they've been all there all the way along. So okay, would you allow me to propose the rec officer's recommendation, please? Yes, that's fine. I'll second it. Um, that's fine. It was uh, sorry. What else did you say about it, um, Councillor well, Colton? It was just the question of whether those with doggies need to declare an yeah. interest. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Sorry, uh, Mr. Gill, could you give an answer to that? Yes, certainly, Chair. <clears throat> the answer is no because um, this um, order uh, affects you just exactly the same as any other dog owner in the borough. So no, there's no requirement to make a, a declaration of an interest. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you. Uh, it has been proposed. Uh, there's no more people to ask, answer questions. Ask questions. It has been proposed by Councillor Jeffrey Corpman and seconded by myself, Councillor Linda Broadley. The recommendation that the Public Space Protection Order Regulation of Dogs 2021, as set out in Appendix Two of this report, is considered and recommended to full council for approval. Does everybody agree with that? Chair, if I may, 
we can take a recorded style vote as it's a decision making item. So I'll call members' names out alphabetically, and if you can indicate for abstain or uh, sorry for against or abstain, and we'll start with Councillor Adams. Sorry, oh. sorry, Samuel. Yes. A little confused. Shouldn't be after all these years. You say a decision is being made. So the, the decision is to recommend the PSPO ah. up to full council. So in right. accordance with our remote procedure rules, we will do a recorded style vote. Does that clarify that, Councillor Charlesworth? It is. So the recommendation goes to full council. That's yeah. correct, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Rosemary, uh, sorry, Councillor Adams. Yeah, four. Um, Councillor Broadley. Four. Councillor Carter. Four. Councillor Charlesworth. Four. Councillor Dar. Four. Councillor Gattaraya. Four. Councillor Geoffrey Kaufman. Four. Councillor Lily Kaufman. Four. Councillor Koslowski. Four. And Councillor Lloydal. Four. That's unanimous in favour, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we move on to item eight, the review of the Hackney Carriage and Private Hire Licensing Policy. March 2021. Report from the Regulatory Service Manager, please. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, the... so, sorry, um, sorry about that. I've just re realised you um, sent a report, a supplementary out to members, which unfortunately wasn't sent until quite late, and some of us haven't been able to read it. Uh, Mr. Ball, could you put it on the screen and give um, give us some time for members to be able to read uh, this as it's part of the report? Absolutely, Chair. I've now um, presenting the first page of the addendum. Um, if all members, um, once they've read the first, if I try and, can everybody read it's, that? It's or should I zoom small. in a bit? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's better. There we go. Chair, if you uh, guide me as to when I can move down and we'll take a, an indicator okay. from the speed of your reading, OK? OK. I can move up, please. Okay. Okay. That's the last page, Chair. Thank you. All right. Is everybody happy that they've managed to read that and digest it? Or does anybody require anything any longer? Can't see any hands up. So we'll continue then. Uh, Right, if you'd like to present your report. 
Thank you very much, Chair. Um, what I'll do is I'll take it uh, question by question in terms of what that what councillors have asked and ask for any comments as we go through it. And then that way it should assist councillors in deciding what they want to do with the policy. Um, it, what we've been required to do by statutory, um, statutory guidance from uh, statutory legislation from government is under the statutory taxi and private hire vehicles, there has been legislation passed which must be followed by local authorities. And that is the reason for the update of the um, Hackney Cage and private hire vehicles licensing policy. And these are mandatory requirements um, for which have to be applied and they are for the protection of the vulnerable. So whoever that may be. So the, there are certain things that are in the policy. However, the councillors asked on the, um, in the licensing and regulatory committee asked for there to be a couple of questions in relation to uh, issues that they felt were necessary. The first one of those being provision of a TFL style taxi. Um, there, were 200, uh, there were 285 responses so far and eight emails, um, but specifically the questions were asked on the website, provision of TFL style taxis was no 265, yes 20. The issue that we've had in relation to that was addressed in the um, appendix, that appendix two, which was forward with the actual meeting, that following the investigations or the council's considerations is following the investigation responses received, the consultation and the company who produced the TFL taxis will no longer be producing these vehicles. The council is minded not to impose a restriction on the type of vehicles used, having taken into account the responses from the industry, um, and it was quite a sizable return, um, and the representation a common one was London black tiles vehicles, although which uh, wheelchair accessible can be very inaccessible for disabled people, not in wheelchair. And they are extremely expensive. Um, and also the vehicles would not fit within the other regimes that we're potentially looking at in terms of the environment and the reduction of emissions. So that was the TFL style London taxis. Can I give that back to your chair and see whether there's any comment in relation to that matter? Uh, no hands are raised as far as I can. Oh, oh sorry, yes, there is. Councillor Geoffrey Corbyn first. Yeah, thank you. I see the way the questions are asked. Um, and, and, and I know you only dealt with the first book, but the general principle is that as far as I can see, the trade who have responded want no change at all because it will cost them money and they don't mind whether that the area is polluted and that we do nothing about equalities. I don't think I ever, I don't think I as a member ever wanted a London style taxi unless people, unless they wanted to use it. I think all I have ever said, and I look at these answers, um, uniform color, well, take it or leave it, it's not important. Whether you have a London style taxi is not important. What I consider very important is that we as a council have an equalities agenda. And I thought equalities for us was very, very important. And I think if we're licensing a hackney carriage, and I remind ourselves that I'm not talking about private car hire, in the same way as somebody who goes to a bus stop and expects with disabilities, it expects these days for a bus to come along that, that's DDA, I think that's a term, compliant. When you're hailing a taxi, a hackney carriage, I think um, we should be insisting that it is a DDA compliant and you can get a wheelchair on board. I, I, if I've read the report correctly, we talk about allowing them those that we're helping it by saying you can have a taxi that's in perfect condition up to 10 years. So in order to encourage you, you can keep your taxi for 10 years if it's DDA compliant. I'm not asking that tomorrow everybody has to go and have a DDA compliant vehicle. I think all I'm saying is 
as far as equalities are concerned, which I thought as a local authority, we thought were very, very important, particularly uh, equalities for people with disabilities. I think they're one of the nine protected whatever uh, that we've been told over the years. I think we should be saying that a date in the future, I don't mind whether it's a London tax, and I don't really care the colour, but we should say that it's available for people in wheelchairs because you will hail it in the street. It's not as though you can book it. Well, you can book it, I suppose. But if you're the very idea of a hackney carriage is that it can be hailed. And you shouldn't have a, a, somebody with disabilities out of principle hailing a taxi which they can't use in this day of equalities. And as are all these lists, I, I'm not quite sure why one is a, only 181 people took part in and some of the others had 282. And I'm not quite sure, you haven't got down there yet and I don't know whether the chair will allow me to discuss it, but there's somebody who uh, says it's great you're reviewing the taxi policy. Why is there no disabled access vehicles and that sort of thing. I'm not sure how many people reply to that one, but I suppose Ms. Koshua will get down to that. But I think as a matter of absolute principle, I don't care what colour the taxi is. I don't care if it looks like a London taxi van. We're told they're going out of business. But what we should be insisting is, as the same as places in Leicester and other places out the country, that at some date in the future, if you want to run a hackney carriage and have a benefit of using the bus lanes and all the and, and understand cheaper insurance, that's why they have hackney carriages here. We should insist on an appropriate vehicle. Otherwise, equalities means nothing in this council. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Did you want to come back, Mr. Courtson? Uh, yeah, I apologise for my maths in terms of that. That is an error on my part in terms of the 188 should have been 244. Um, it was similar to the aid policy um, changes. In, in terms of us bringing in a policy in relation to vehicles being changed over to uh, DDA, um, I think we, we as an, an authority may be in a difficult position in terms of bringing that policy in because it would be discriminatory on the taxi drivers, I feel. Uh, I, know, I understand the issue that we've got in terms of the lack of them. And that's why we've tried to make, we have listened to the correspondents and we have had some disabled people who've actually um, responded to it. It isn't just all taxi drivers that have uh, responded. We have had members of the public, particularly the disabled. And that's why we've made the, uh, the 10 years uh, extension for um, disabled vehicles or DDA compatible vehicles um, to be used for 10 years because they are expensive in terms of what they're doing. So I apologise if that's um, a, a short Can answer, I... but that's a sure issue, I'm afraid. Uh, Councillor Coffin, before you come in, can I bring in Mr Gill, please? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I, I reiterate or support what Mr. Coulthorn has, has said, but one of the fundamental issues uh, in respect of requiring taxis or hackneys all to be wheelchair accessible is that ultimately there is no demand in the borough. We have no complaints about from people who are disabled that they want uh, or, or can't access vehicles. Um, the other point that has been made is that not all people with disabilities are in wheelchairs and and the London style cab is, is not appropriate for every type of disability. Um, in, in the absence, I see great difficulty in us unilaterally deciding that at some point in the future every vehicle in our fleet is going to be wheelchair accessible because the reality is all that will happen is the drivers that we currently have will go to Wolverhampton, where there's no such policy. They will go to the city, to Blaby, um, and then we will have no taxis that are registered in the borough, which means that we will have no control over the fleet in general, because the only people that can take action against a taxi is the licensing authority that has licensed it. Um, so if one of our taxi drivers misbehaves in the city, the city have to come to us and we take the action. And likewise, 
uh, if one of theirs uh, misbehaves in OD, uh, we have to go to the city and ask them to take the action. So it's not a simple matter. Um, we've considered it, we've looked at it. A wheelchair accessible vehicle, even if it's not a London style cab, is probably 40 or 50 thousand uh, pounds, which the taxi drivers are not going to be willing to uh, invest in. Uh, and looking through some of the, the responses to the consultations, they made it quite clear. We, we will just go, we will just not bother with OB. So um, we have tried. If there is a demand, if we can prove the demand, we then possibly could look at having a proportion of the vehicles. But it's how you determine that proportion. Um, and if you're the unfortunate driver who is the 29th person to be licensed, and you're the one that's got to have a vehicle that's 40 or 50,000 pounds, whereas the one that's 28 or 30 can have an, a normal standard vehicle, people are just not going to make applications. Did you want to come back, Councillor Kaufman? Yes, please. Um, Mr. Kosher mentioned, he said, in his comments, there's um, a quality, it wouldn't be fair on the taxi drivers. I think he used the word a quality for the tax, a quality for taxi drivers, I think, in his comments, which I find rather strange. Now, look, if these people go to strange places like Wolverhampton or the city or whatever it is, what they will come back and want to operate cars here, there will be private car hire and there won't be hackney carriages because if I, unless I understand it correctly, Wolverhampton hackney carriages can't uh, I can't um, operate in our borough as hackney carriages, the same as the city ones can. So if they choose to become private car hire and don't want the benefits of the bus lanes and cheaper insurance, that's a commercial decision for them. I just don't understand how it is considered fair for taxi drivers in other areas to be compelled to have hackney carriages of a design that people in wheelchairs can get in. I've, we all agree, I think, that if they're not making London taxes as what I knew London tax, taxes to be, if they're not making new, can't have them. But what is certainly being made this day and age is vehicles being used as hackney carriages which have wheelchair access. We know that. And um, if they don't want it, okay, but we have it as a duty. And to say, there's no demand. Well, I don't suppose there's much demand uh, for to turn the buses into DDR um, compliant. Ne ne and he never thought that people in wheelchairs would get on the buses. It's things we never thought of that we were discriminating those people. This day and age, people are traveling around, uh, not locked in institutions because they're disabled. And I think it's a retrograde step. And I really think that sometime we least ought to set a, as I said just now, we ought to set an aim at some time in the future. If you want to run a hackney carriage, we can't do anything about private cars, uh, but if we want to run a hackney carriage in our borough, it's got to be at least of the equivalent standard of Leicester City and other places where they would just not get licenses for that sort of vehicle. It'd be interested to know where the taxi drivers in Leicester City and Nottingham and all the other places are getting them from if they're no longer making them. If I can just come back on that, uh, Councillor Kaufman, um, not all hackney carriages in the city are wheelchair accessible. They don't, they don't operate the policy that you can only be a hackney carriage if you have a wheelchair accessible vehicle. Uh, and, and another point, and from a personal point of view, my mother is disabled, my mother is in a wheelchair. I drive a saloon family style car, which is suitably adequate for her, that she can get in and out of it. It's just the right height for her, and there's room in the boot for the wheelchair. So uh, I'm... If, I think there's, there's becoming, and, and I don't mean to be rude, a bit of a fixation on a wheelchair accessible vehicle. I am aware that there is some case law with regard to uh, the way in which councils have required particular types of vehicle before they will license them. So, so may I suggest that, that what we do is um, 
I go away and look at some research about the case law, and then perhaps either outside of the meeting uh, or at a future meeting, we come back and um, discuss the point again. Because I think, uh, as it stands tonight, I don't think um, we're going to be able to move any further on that point. I know that you would like a date in the future. So if that's what you would like, then can you I'm give us... I'm very happy. I'm very happy and grateful for you to go away uh, and do your research. And thank you very much for that. But I don't want to be at the end of this evening. You've done the research and we've found a way around it to help people with disabilities and a sensible way around it and say, well, we've already decided not to do it, so we can't change it. Uh, I'm very grateful for, for this offer to go away. Well, well, what, what the policy will say at this point is that at this point, members have decided not to require wheelchair accessible vehicles. If my research identifies that there is a way of doing it, then we can reconsider the, the policy. You, the policy can be changed at any point within, it, within its lifespan. It doesn't have to be done every five years. If we want to change it um, in six months or eight months or 10 months, then it can come back to members and members will have the opportunity uh, of changing it. So we're not ruling it out. We're saying at this time, it, uh, we propose that we don't go down that route, but further research will be done on the matter. And if we can identify a way of doing it, then it will be presented to members for to, uh, to take a view. Okay, thank you. I think, uh, like you say, we've gone as far as we can on that, Councillor Gorthman. Um, and if uh, Mr Gill does that uh, research and uh, brings it to you and then perhaps to the group, we can then make the decision. Uh, Councillor Lucif Dahl, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I think what Ms. Gill has said uh, is perfectly acceptable to me, at least. I think I want to ask us that on the addendum, he talks about uh, emission and uh, I think it's tax uh, information, which he says is not coming in till 22, in another year's time. Just that element or the whole policy? Uh, with, after that answer, I'll move the recommendation, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The position is that if, if you approve the policy, then we could determine the date that we could set it. We would obviously need to um, notify people of the policies changing. My view would be that um, the policy be approved from the 1st of April, which gives us the ability to make any slight amends that are required and notify the trade. The addendum uh, with regard to the, um, the tax uh, changes in HMRC, that only was published this week, and that's the reason why it, it forms part of the addendum. Um, government have decided that um, taxi drivers and operators form part of what may be determined as the black economy. Um, and they are keen to ensure that um, people um, pay their full liabilities in terms of tax, etc. So that is why they're going to require us uh, to um, make sure that, that people have notified the taxman that that's what they're doing and they're properly registered. It comes in next year. Uh, we have brought it to your attention for information um, because what we will need to do um, when that comes in is we will need to amend the policy to reflect the documentation that we require. And if that's coming in next year, rather than um, having to reconsult and everything on the policy, because it's a change of fact and law, what we're proposing is that... that delegated authority be given to change the policy to reflect the government position? I hope that answers, answers the question. Yeah, thank you, Mr Gill. It's uh, quite crafty of the government to get uh, licensing committees to do their um, work for them to get the taxes in, isn't it? But there you go. Uh, Councillor Rosemary Adams. Note, put a hand down. Uh, Councillor Lloydell. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with it, though, Chair. Um, I think Mr Gill is quite right. Um, it, 
does need to be looked at. The make sure that um, the dues and demands of the country are being met by all people um, and perhaps the government ought to look in other areas as well to make sure they're all meeting their tax demands. Um, going back to the document, I, I was um, telephoned by one of the taxi drivers um, with regards to this document and tried to answer some of his questions. And I think this document actually has addressed them uh, probably not to his satisfaction. One of them was regards to renewing of the taxes. And we all know that there are some people um, in the taxi business who will renew their taxes on a regular basis and keep them up to standard. We also know that there are others that need to be given a guiding hand in doing that. But I think this, gov this document actually meets the requirements and takes into account the concerns, especially as they, I will admit, they have had a very hard time, like everybody else during the pandemic, but this document does meet that. With regards to Councillor Kaufman's query over um, taxes having disabled access, do we still offer a reduction in the license fee for those who have a, a taxi that is suitable for disabled access. Um, I'm quite sure that a few years ago that was introduced. Do we still have that? One of the other questions as well that the um, taxi driver actually spoke about was the necessity to have a uniform. Now, I don't think he's read the document correctly because I think we were only talking about a uniform colour for taxes, which has been disregarded. I can't find anywhere in this document that taxi drivers, drivers have to wear a uniform. Could you please just correct me? I'm, I think I'm correct. I couldn't find anything, but just check. And um, finally, on page 105, um, the statutory conditions, we've got there, the council must amend its policy by Act of Parliament to incorporate the statutory requirements as set out within the, and, and it ends there. Um, I think that probably needs to be finished off correctly. So it's just a question now about uniform, question about reduction for, um, licenses for disabled access vehicles. Um, otherwise, Chair, I'm fully supportive of this document. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lloyd. Well, um, I'll just add one further question before I bring uh, Tracy, the Senior Licensing Officer, in to answer them. Um, vehicles of 10 years of age that uh, are going to require a new vehicle, is this going to be on a sliding scale? So that somebody who at this moment in time has a vehicle of 10 years or even 12 years that we have licensed uh, for the last however long, um, are we going to give them time to replace the vehicle so that, you know, we will still continue to license them until, you know, you've, you've got two years or you've got a year to replace your, um, because it does seem a bit unfair that if, um, we've licensed them over 10 years up to now, or even up to the 10 years, that we turn around and say, right, well, your license is up for renewal. We're not doing it now because you are, you've reached the 10 years, or actually you're 12 years now, but that we've continued to license them in the past. Um, I just need that if that is the case, uh, then there is some siding scale to say, look, your vehicle's 12 years old, we have always licensed it. We will license it this time, but we'll give you a year to replace the vehicle. Um, is that something that's done? I'll come to Tracy or Winkle first, please. Good evening, Chair. Good evening. Um, in relation to the disabled vehicles, 
Uh, we do offer a 25% discount um, for, you know, for people that are, that are licensing um, vehicles for, for wheelchair access and that sort of thing. And I, I don't believe that that's, that's going to change. Um, in relation to the, the other matters, can I ask that you speak to uh, Mr Cawthorn, um, as he's the one that's written written report, and I've been mainly on COVID stuff, so I wouldn't want okay. to speak out of turn. Right, Mr Cawthorn then, please. I think we've lost him, uh, Chair. So no, sorry, got... I apologise. I am here. Um, right. I, I apologise for uh, abusing the mute button. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, in terms of uh, what's been suggested in going back um, to the um, disabled access, there is case law in relation to taxi drivers and not being able to discriminate against any disabled access uh, for anybody. So they are required by law to actually assist anybody who is DDA. Um, and that is part of legislation and that um, covers all taxi drivers, no matter what they're in. So the, um, in terms of other questions that have been asked, um, the current age is 11 years for any vehicle. And part of the addendum that was added today, we're looking to start the policy not at 1st of April 2021, but 1st of April 2022. Um, and then it would be reduced uh, on an annual basis. Part of the communications pa uh, package that we will have to put together is to fully inform the industry in terms of what we're going to do and how we're going to enforce it. Currently, any vehicle over the age of 11 years of age, we are not licensing. And that has been current. That has been the policy for uh, all the way through the last document. We have done in exceptional circumstances um, uh, applied our ex exceptional use policy uh, or to vehicles that are in an exceptional standard. Um, but if they are not, and after 11 years, not many people, vehicles are, um, we will not license them. But that is, uh, so we'll give it a year for this to settle in for the uh, industry and bring it in from the 1st of April 22. And as I said, that was the, one of the addendums um, to the document. Um, if the chair could advise me of what the other questions were, and I'll answer them one by one, if that's possible. Councillor Lloyd, if you... Yeah, I, can, I can perhaps assist. One of the questions was about a uniform yeah. uh, for okay. drivers. Um, you're quite right, Councillor Lloyd, on the, uh, the driver had misread the policy. It was a reference to a uniform colour for vehicles, not a uniform to be worn by the drivers. Um, uh, and I think... That was it. I think. And, and yeah, that's it. And then just the amendment. And then, can I just make one, one point of clarification on what Mr. Cawthorn has just said? Yes. Whilst the policy will come into force on the 1st of April 2021, the vehicle age section of that policy will not come into force until the 1st of April 2022, uh, provided members agree with that. So, anybody that currently has a, um, a vehicle that is, that is pushing up to the 11 year um age limit they will have 12 months to get them to give themselves an opportunity to uh, get a new vehicle and then from 2022 going forward the vehicle age will reduce by one year until we get to 2025 or 2026 whatever it is uh, and then we will be looking at only licensing vehicles that are under six years old and um, part of that is, is going back to what Councillor Caulfield was saying it's to do with the the government's uh, environmental agenda the uh, carbon neutral uh, approach and the fact that come 2030 there'll be no new um, uh, petrol and diesel vehicles being sold so that that is the intention of the policy okay that's lovely thank you uh, Chairman, I'm sorry to cut across you on that. I do apologise for doing that. But with regards to what Mr Gill has just said, can we have assurances from Mr Gill that we are legally covered fully within the law in doing that, in that if there is an incident takes place, 
where a vehicle has a serious accident in this interim period and the car is out of our age that we would usually license it, are we as a council covered? There will be no comeback from the driver or the operator to say, well, the council gave us that leeway. So are we legally covered? Thank you. The, the position council has lawyer is that vehicles are required to have two MOT tests yeah. Um, a year, and they have them at, at our council-approved uh, MOT stations. Um, the fact that that we license vehicles currently between ten and eleven years is not an issue. Um, and if if members chose tonight not to accept this policy, you could c carry on licensing vehicles up, up to eleven years um, forever. Um, as Mr. Cawthorn said, there are occasions when we do license vehicles that are, that are over 11 years mm. because they are in a, an exceptional condition. And part of the process of that is that when they go for their MOT at that age, the examiner is not only looking at the instant fault, so to speak, the, the condition of the vehicle on that day, but they're also making a judgment about whether that vehicle is likely to become mechanically unroadworthy within the next 12 months. And if they think that it is, then they will refuse the MOT. And if there's no MOT, then we won't license it. So there is no liability on the council whatsoever. The bottom line is, that at the end of the day, it is down to the driver and or the operator to ensure that that vehicle is in a, a safe condition on the road, just like you and I are with our own personal vehicles. Yeah, fine. Thank you, Chair. And the last bit of my question um, was on page 105 that yes, the final we, bit of that paragraph be f f finished off so it doesn't end with the... Thank you, yes. Chair. I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's quite right, Councillor Lloyd. Did you want to second uh, uh, Councillor um, Dar's motion? Yes, Chair, I will quite happily do that. I will second the motion. OK, so it has been proposed by uh, Councillor Dar and seconded by Councillor Helen lloyd -Hull. Uh, is everybody in favour? Please raise their hands if you are not. Chair, again, in, in accordance with the remote procedure right. rules, I need to take a recorded style vote. Um, OK. So I'll go through the names and if you could indicate for, again, Sorry, to abstain. Yeah, before, before we go any further, Mr. Ball, can I just uh, make a point, Chair, that um, in dealing with the recommendations, that we're talking about the policy set out at Appendix 1, as yes. amended by the addendum, because the addendum, uh, Appendix yeah. 1, talks about um, starting from nine years from the first of April, but we've changed it. So, um, subject to what's been agreed tonight, that there will be a lead-in and that the vehicle part of the policy will start in 2022 to give yeah. that extension. We are agreeing at this stage that we do not propose to make any changes to the vehicles that we um, license. We are saying there's no standardized color for the fleet. Uh, and again, the, um, the vehicle age policy is approved. There's also the further recommendation chair because the consultation technically doesn't close until the 16th. So in the event that any more consultation responses come in, it's proposed that they are dealt with by me in consultation with yourself uh, to decide whether or not there needs to be any amendment to the policy. Um, okay. So, Is that agreeable to you, Councillor Dar and Councillor Lloydell? Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes. I'm sorry, I should have noted the random bit. Yes, yeah. of course. Okay, yeah. thank you. Sorry, Councillor Lloyd, were you in agreement? Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Council, uh, sorry, um, Mr. Ball, then, please, if you want to take the vote. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Adams? Four. Councillor Broadley? Four. Councillor Carter? Four. Councillor Charlesworth? Four. Councillor Dar? Four. Councillor Gattaraya? Four. Councillor Geoffrey Corfman? Four. Councillor Lily Corfman? Four. Councillor Kozlowski? Four. And Councillor Lloydell. 
once again unanimous in favour chair thank you well that uh, concludes the business of this uh, licensing and regulatory committee uh, so i would like to wish you all a good night thank you <laughs>